Uh, after the atrocity that took place, the, the assault on our civil society that took place in, in uh, September 2001, there was a <coughs> ceremony at the National Cathedral attended by the President, the leaders of Congress, and so on, where the sermon, the official sermon for the United States was preached by the Reverend Billy Graham. Mr. Graham and his colleagues have been, have been found many times to have published uh, obscene and defamatory remarks about the Jewish people, and they never tire of uh, drawing attention to the heresies and vileness of the Prophet Muhammad. And on this occasion, he, I think the Reverend went a little further. He said that all those who had died in those buildings had died and gone straight to heaven. By the way, I had no idea that many people in New York were in a state of grace around the clock. <laughs> and wouldn't have credited it on empirical evidence, had gone straight to heaven, were there and were happy, and would not come back if they could. Now, what is this but the theology of bin Ladenism? It claims to know the way to paradise. It claims to know how to get there by violence. It claims to know what it's like there when you are there. This is an appalling piece of impudence. It, but it is, it is bin Ladenism in every detail except that of the 72 virgins who would accompany every... Um, every victim to his last reward and that some textual scholarship has asserted is a misprint and has long been a misprint for grapes it's not it's probably 72 bunches of grapes but there is there's, there may by the way also, there's a t further Talmudic commentary on this not very well known which says that you may get 72 virgins but they come with 72 mothers-in-law um, only the rabbis know this uh, I know one senator's wife who walked out uh, of that disgusting ceremony and as a consequence of that appalling speech. But it seems to me extraordinary that such a thing at such a time could be so easily and so readily accepted. We have an attorney general who says that in these United States, according to his permission, we have no king but Jesus. This statement is already two words too long. We have no king in the United States, and that's all the Attorney General needs to know about it. <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance is also now two words, too long. The words under God that were inserted into it, breaking such rhythm as it had as an original pledge, and it's not bad in its original, inserted opportunistically in, in the 1950s, are deliberately designed to exclude or make to feel uncomfortable uh, those of us who are members of the fastest growing minority not just in the United States, but in the world. Those of us who affirm no religious authority for ourselves. When the president meets in times of crisis, places are set for imams, <coughs> for rabbis, for bishops, uh, for preachers of uh, the television and of every other stripe and kind. There's no heresy you can't be promulgating and not be invited to the White House to show pluralism, but there is no room and there never has been any invitation to the secular humanist organizations of the United States who are presumed to have nothing to say in this great crisis of holy war <coughs> and jihad. And this in the country that distinguishes itself above all by being not just the first but still the only nation in the world to be founded on written documents and promises of rights that are innate in humans that are the reward or promise of nobody and to have a constitution that specifically does not mention the word God. There is no country in the world, in my opinion, and I've been visiting a lot of them lately in pursuit of this sign. there's no country in the world that wouldn't be a great deal better off if it was to adopt some version of that constitution and that Bill of Rights. It shows something that has become increasingly evident in the last few years, that the American Revolution is the only one still standing, the only revolution that has any combat or merit or virtue left in it. And this, I think, confers upon us, and I think especially on you, ladies and gentlemen, a certain responsibility. If this is to be defended and asserted and protected from its enemies abroad, it, it as a godless and secular system, should be a great deal better appreciated than it is, and a great deal more cherished, and a great deal more firmly upheld um, at home as well. So, with this very simple conclusion, I leave you with 
with enormous gratitude for your, for your company, and I'm at, your, I'm at your service. Thank you. I'm going to give them a few minutes to talk to each other, and then we'll start having questions. And then when they, when they ask questions, if you can just keep the questions, the sound in the room is not getting no, the right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's follow the tradition and take a few minutes to chat with our neighbor to see what you're interested in and what question you want to ask, and then we'll uh, open with a few student questions and then open it up to everyone. It gives me time for a drink. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd go straight to the bar. How long do you think? First question. Let's start with a student question. Don't be shy. Right over here. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll relay the question. I think, I think uh, the acoustics mandate that. Yes. The gentleman asks me why I laid such stress on the horror of benevolent theism um, and invites me to discourse a bit on the distinction between that and the, and the malevolent kind. Does that, would that be a fair praise to you of your question? Well, first, I must say I never miss a chance to take communion, so <laughs> there you go. And it's, I wish every uh, campus was like this. Um, it's because I think that uh, dictatorship for your own good, as it were, is the most oppressive kind. In other words, the, the, the paternalist who claims to know what your interests are and to be always looking out for you is much more irritating in a way than someone says, as long as you pay, pay the taxes and bow the knee as I pass with my, my chariot, I couldn't give a damn about you. I'd far rather live under the second regime myself. Um, and it's a conundrum for believers, this. Um, it's obviously not much of a conundrum for me because I don't believe in either God or the devil. But it was noticed by William Blake, who had a strong interest in the transcendental, that throughout Paradise Lost, John Milton appears to sympathize with Lucifer and give him all the best lines and, it, and award him all the brave actions, in effect, and said that, you know, is it possible? He said that John Milton was... A, a, of the devil's party without knowing it. And because I think that literature is the way to investigate these arguments, and it gives us a much more sensitive register than theology or hermeneutics, I've always thought that was a, a very, very good question. It's quite clear that when Milton tries to imagine what paradise is like, he can't do it, or not in a way that he can make attractive to anyone else. It sounds ghastly. Um, but a rebellion in heaven by someone who says, I would rather serve in hell than reign in heaven. So, excuse me, rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. I got that wrong. But in other words, who repudiates the idea of being a permanent, adoring, fawning, flunky in paradise. So I'd rather have my own deal, even if it took me to the infernal regions. Well, that's actually what the Puritan Revolution was all about. It, it was the assertion of, of right in that way. And that's why I find all this so fascinating. 